All right, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're thrilled to be joined today by three expert gardeners. We have Chris Collins, Sally Morgan, and Matt Reese Warren. So this panel will be able to answer all your gardening questions. So send them all, all our way. <laughs> um, please do use the chat box. So yeah, any, any comments or questions is into the chat box and we'll try and delve into those as we go. Um, I first wanted to say just a huge congrats to Matt, whose new book, The Ecological Gardener, is published today. Um, so we're Happy all day. <laughs> a glass of water to you, Matt. Uh, yeah, Hopefully cheers. you have something alcoholic on that end. <laughs> Peppermint tea, uh, the best yeah, I can do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's a huge achieve, achievement to, to write a book and it's turned out beautifully. It's full of practical tips about, you know, ecological approaches to gardens and design and we'll be speaking about it today. Um, so let me just do a quick intro to everyone. So Matt Reese Warren has uh, over 15 years of experience in gardening. He's worked at the National Trust. He was head gardener at Kilver Court Gardens in Somerset and has published articles in RHS's The Garden, Somerset Life, and Country Gardener. Um, we are also joined by Sally Morgan, who is the editor of the Soil Association's Organic Farming Magazine. Sally writes regularly for gardening and smallholding magazines and is a member of the Garden Media Guild. She's also author of several books, including The Climate Change Garden and her forthcoming book with Chelsea Green, which we're excited about, uh, is the Healthy Vegetable Garden, which comes out in September. Um, and then last but not least, Chris, who's, who's leading our conversation tonight, Chris Collins, who has an amazing and diverse career in horticulture. He's worked at Kew Gardens, head gardener for Westminster Abbey. He's been on BBC Two series, The Plantsman, and numerous television shows. So we're really excited to have Chris with us. He is also um, voted in the Horticulture Week uh, among the top 50 gardening influencers and works alongside Gardener Organic a lot. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And I will hand it over to you, Chris, to delve into the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie. Um, I'm Sally and uh, Matt, a big congratulations to you. Um, thank you for inviting me along this evening. I'm uh, very honored. Uh, before I get going and, and um, what I'll do is I'll, if you can send your questions in via chat, I shall read them out for you and I'm sure you'll enjoy the responses. I'll just say a little bit about the book before we get going. Um, I really enjoyed the, the book, Matt. I read it earlier in the week. I became very okay. engaged in it. Now, it's very, very good. I, I, it's definitely one thing. It's, it's written by a man who practices his art, I would say. You're obviously very much engaged in actually putting this in on the ground. Um, at times, I felt like I was alongside you and I think anyone listening... If you read the book, you'll, you'll, you'll be engaged in what I say is a kindred spirit. You know, if you're into organic gardening, natural gardening, it's, I definitely got that feel from it. It has some beautiful quotes in it. Um, I think dominance is a, a, over nature is a fool's choice or fool's gold. Gold is one of the things I remember really taking away from it. And that working alongside nature, um, as you all know, horticulture has changed greatly in the last, you know, over the 30 years from when I started, where it was about control and everything was edged and weeded and yeah. striped on the lawn. And now we're at a place where we're much more relaxed about it, much more freer. And we realise it's a shared space. And you you kind of go through it all. I was I was quite interested in the fact you start with design because I think that gets skipped over quite a lot in a lot of books, organic books, because obviously from where to start to look at a space and consider the topography, the microclimates, all that kind of thing, before you even get going, is quite important so i really enjoyed that chapter and then you obviously go on to soils very passionate we all are about soils but it comes across well. gotta be gotta, gotta be, be mate full of practical advice on how to compost especially hot composting i got a lot from and then on to your plants a, a big big rallying cry for them for the natives for the more natural plants we find in the uk and then yeah. water which is water was interesting wasn't it because it was kind of there's some big stats in there and and you can go, oh dear, and then you kind of come up with the solutions for it. So you kind of go in thinking, oh dear, and then you come out going, oh right. It, I thought that was quite an interesting chapter. And then <laughs> wildlife, which is you obviously very passionate about, and um, getting now we we understanding that um, it's a shared space, isn't it? Our garden is a shared space. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think okay. many people feel that. Yeah. 
yeah, so we, we, we want it to be, we want we want the blue tips to be flying in and we want all this stuff going on. And, and also it helps with our gardening generally. But that's enough from me. I'm sure you'll say a lot more about it. I'm going to dive into the questions. I wanted to start with one here, maybe a general one. And that's just, um, what does the ecological garden mean to each of you? And how do you bring ecological principles to your work as gardeners? Maybe you start with that, Matt. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think to sort of distill the principle of ecological garden down, it would be to just say a little of what you've said there, that it's about putting nature first. It doesn't mean that um, it's nature only. It will always be us. It's not gonna be a wild space where we're not involved. It's the human hand and uh, nature together, you know? So, but it must be first, like you say, we've, we've enacted, a period of dominance um, going back to the sort of, you know, landscaping movement where it was showing how human could take over uh, nature and sort of exact control. And um, I, I think sort of ecological gardening to me definitely means the idea of giving back and releasing the relayings of those control and learning a different and new craft. Um, you know, I have to stop myself, you know, just professional gardener, I'm doing it all the time, not just a hobby. I have to stop myself and think and, and rethink. And, uh, you know, I've done, uh, you know, in long enough to do ways and different means of garden craft that now I rethink about. So it's, it's for, for anyone and everyone, it isn't some, a closed book. Everyone can turn and, and turn a new leaf and look at it again, I think. it's um, But certainly nature first, biodiversity, um, you know, a garden as a portal of change and being a, a sanctuary for wildlife. And it's certainly a, a way that I would look at it, yeah. Sally, you want to add um, to that? Yeah, I, I'm very much the same. Um, I did a lot of ecology at university. I've spent hours trawling across the South Downs counting species in quadrats and things. So I suppose my... Um, thought of the sort of relationship with my garden is very much one of a community um, and how the living organisms react with the non-living aspects of the habitat. Um, I think for me going around my garden space I have to remember that I am also part of that community and uh, and I also like uh, biodiversity I think is my my driver um, I'm still a bit of an ecological nerd, you know, I do tick off species and add up my biodiversity and think, oh, 54... Ecologist, an ecologist, eh, Sally? <laughs> <laughs> 54 species of birds seen around it's the garden. Yes. You throw yes. triangles onto bits of the ground and... and uh... <laughs> not quite, but yeah, my polyculture, yeah, I can count the species. So, yeah, exactly. I'm always looking for as much diversity as possible, which will give me a, a, a resilient growing space that will be able to cope with whatever is thrown at it in the future. Brilliant. I, 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 I love the idea of community, that word of bit of garden being a community amongst species. I think that's so good. I think for me, coming being from a man who was sort of parks trained in botanic garden, very much from an amenity background, uh, changing to sort of natural organic garden, I feel much closer to the subject. I don't know if you agree with this, but I kind of, and my observation of it all is, is grown as a result of doing it that way. I, I, f I feel more connected to it as a result of, of organic gardening and natural gardening. Uh, it, it's, 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 in, it's become more entrenched in my soul, I suppose, in a way. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. I'll move on to the next question. Um, so, yeah, it's springtime, the perfect time to get your hands dirty. What are the key things you should be thinking about and doing right now? Obviously, this is our busy time, isn't it? Yeah, busiest time of the year. I mean, there's um, 101 things to do every day. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't do better now than um, you know seeding. Um, whether that's seeding sort of annual wildflowers or even perennial, though they'd be better in the autumn, uh, or seeding your veg. You know, starting stuff off some of your tender stuff like cucumbers or, uh, you know, um, aubergines or anything like that now. Um, you know, there's a million things, staking, tying in, you know, some of the roses growth you'll see or climbers or anything like that, start tying it in, you'll, you'll notice it starts sort of plopping into your face or something and you'll realize that stuff is starting to, um, you know, rip away. Planting out, I mean, potting on, it seriously is the busiest, busiest time. You couldn't not do something now, you wouldn't be. <laughs> 
you, you wouldn't be gardening if you were looking for jobs to do now. It's uh, it's the great time. I always look forward to it. You know, it's, it's, every gardener will tell you that um, late spring or especially May is the greatest month of the year. It's it's a wonderful time to garden. It really, really is. Sally, um, I think. A, a word of warning to some people because I keep on seeing on my Instagram feeds and things I've sown this and I've done that and I was thinking oh that's a bit early a bit, <laughs> <laughs> a bit early it's I know we've got climate change but it could easily have frost until June so I always tell people you know don't rush at it you know you you can catch up at this time of year very quickly so you might feel as if you're three weeks behind your contemporaries on Instagram but the, the plants will catch up um I was talking to Sally next the other day and she was saying, remember to repeat sow. So, you know, you get your first sowing of lettuce in and then you, everybody forgets to do the two weeks later and another one and another one. So get the repeat seeding in. Um, and a little oddity, um, it's birds nesting time. So I throw out all sorts of nesting materials. Um, I have a couple of sheep who shed their own fleece and so I've got fleece all over one of our fields and the birds just love it. Um, so I throw out lots of old wool and bits and pieces for the birds to use as nesting material i think that's you made an important point there as well as if you do so now and for any reason it gets checked we are having the coldest spring i can remember in a long time you can re-sow it's not the end of the world i think that's yeah. quite important you know you can sort of say that and it, it, that kind of that joy of bringing stuff on i've just sowed all my hardy annuals and i went down there today and i like to put bands of them in just as for them to, to encourage the pollinators but you're just looking with anticipation. I don't think you can really replace that excitement, really, can you? Uh, yeah, no, it's just <laughs> it's something else. It, it, you don't know it till you do it, and then you're addicted to it. So that's kind of one of those things, isn't it? <laughs> I've got a question from Amanda. It says, and this is, is tying in with what we've just spoke about, what Sally just spoke about. How do you suggest we plan and, and plant for a climate which is getting warmer, mostly except with predictable cold snaps? Matt? Well, the, yeah, that, that's a really um, big one because I've heard a few debates um, within the sort of more um, <clears throat> garden design community about this. Like, so, um, you know, starting to plant more olives or, um, you know, figs, walnuts, I don't know. Like, so I, I think that's difficult. Like, it's, it's pretty difficult to guess what and how it's going to come about. So is climate change going to mean that you're gonna turn into the Mediterranean? I'm not so sure about that. I, I think it means that things are gonna go um, more extreme, uh, it seems to be, but then again, I'm not um, you know, saying that I can guess anything. Like, you know, the, what they do is not necessarily, they do model, but they're using the information that's come in is what many of the scientists do in the IPCC reports are based upon hard science that they've done rather than they do model, but, but they're just sort of saying, these are what is happening, this is what's, so they don't necessarily say each individual area, this is what's gonna happen to you. So I think um, planting what is more resilient and therefore lasted here for a long time, which is more native plants to me, is a much more um, adaptable way to go. They also already have extremely important relationships with the native wildlife. So it is very difficult. Like if, if you think you want to sort of plant for 150 years in the future and you think it's gonna be a lot hotter and you think it's a good idea to plant olives, <laughs> I mean, I guess, have a go, but um, maybe I don't think that should happen throughout the wild, and I don't, and I don't think that that should be sort of a government initiative or anything. Um, but yeah, it's it's a long way in the future that is unknown, and, and it could be that it's more about floods. It could be more that it's more flooded winters, so you know, Mediterranean plants won't work. So there's a difference between maybe weather and climate have to be distinguished. Do you think that's maybe one thing? You you you're a um, a uh, very expert on climate gardening, Sally. What, what do you think about this? I mean, I'm just going to throw out a few facts to show that actually it's happening now. Um, you know, since the 1960s to 1990s, and um, we're 0 0.8 degree warmer. Um, I've talked to guys who've seen magnolia in flower in January, daffodils in December, um, talked to the Kentish apple harvest guys, and they are harvesting a month earlier than they were in the 1970s. So it is upon us. It was brought home to me at the Dartington estate as I was driven around with their forester 
guys down there and they are not planting any more oak trees, um, at least native English oak trees. They're looking for um, holm oak and other species to replant their woodlands down there. Um, but I think for planning for us, um, I think you're looking, you know, Matt mentioned the magic word resilience. So I think you'll get down to soil health, making sure that you've got good levels of soil organic matter so it can retain the water, but allow the water also to freely drain, to mulch, mulch, mulch as much as possible to keep the, the water in the soil. And if you are going to grow those lovely Mediterranean plants, and I must admit I'm there, um, I've got my olive trees, my lemon trees, uh, salvias and things, uh, canna lilies, um, it's very important to have a well draining soil. So although they can survive hot, dry summers, what they don't like is wet roots. So they really don't like being cold and wet, but they can cope with the cold. I mean, the olives in Spain, up on the mountain sides, they can survive down to minus 15. But what they don't like is wet cold. So if you can put a few raised beds in, get the gravel incorporated, maybe gravel mulch, then allow those plants to get cold, but not wet over winter. And, and, and see how they adapt. And I think you do have to prepare for uh, failures. And, and the same with my vegetables, I hedge my bets. I'm into diversity. So instead of growing one or two vegetables, varieties like beetroots, I'll grow four or five in the hopes that if we have a really funny summer, something is, is going to survive out of the selection that I'm, I'm growing. And don't start me on orchards because orchards are just at risk. That's another book, another series. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very, a very comp uh, comprehensive answer in lots of ways. There, the whole soil health thing is obviously very vital. Mulching. I, I, am, I know from reading Matt's book also the idea of I hate to see exposed soil. I hate to see soil used. And there should be no gaps in anything. When I walk around now and look at amenity situations. And there's like four foot between the shrubs. It drives me absolutely potty. Um, so that, that, that kind of attention to soil health certainly will help the cause, won't it? That's for sure. Um, as soon as you mentioned trees there, because I went to see Tony Kirkham recently up at Kew, who's probably no one knows more about trees than him. And he is saying how the planting is changing due to climate change. And he's seen like 40 seasons at Kew and he's recommending other species. And that's quite interesting to see. So it is a watch this space thing, isn't it? We need to be aware of it, certainly. And Becky Hill was asking how the, this is quite a big subject. I know, especially for us who work with contractors, how are the best to, to influence people who are not on the same page? Clients who want the perfect lawn, want it all neat. Harking back to those days, Matt, where it's all about control. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because uh, discussion is always better than partisanship. You know, it's, it's, it's always better to you know listen and take on sort of what someone's saying and have sort of open discussions that aren't going to end up in in you know arguments. yeah well, the classic down the allotment you know, we're all kind of chatting down the allotment it's a lovely community but people do things different ways um and it's uh, and it's interesting i think and they are they, they you know they might not agree and i might not agree with them but if we can sort of um, easily chat and go away having a nice chat about horticulture that's got to be a good thing um, I, I think you know I wouldn't ever want to elbow my point of view onto someone but maybe like you know things would just naturally change like um, Chris has mentioned you know a lot you know the Percy Thrower age is, is, a, is a really different age you know it's sort of many of those things is still worthwhile still and still those techniques are still great but many of the practices have changed completely and um, and so if you uh, you know come across someone who's in that age or, or, or likes things a certain way then I guess you could um, you know have a healthy discussion with them and they may take something away but you'll also probably more than likely if someone's got a patio and and just you know tropical hanging baskets and then <laughs> maybe you'll never win maybe you'll just never win but you can still get along and be friendly sally what do you think um oh, i think it's one of the best ways is through example um we have an allotment as well um they're all all um organic and we do have one gentleman who used to like to use his spade um, and his fork and everybody else in the allotment was no dig. And um, he was just sort of looking at us and, he, you know, he eventually was sort of coming round to our way of thinking because we had so much more time because we weren't digging. Uh, and I can understand why he wanted to continue to dig, um, partly therapeutic, but 
you know, he was looking around and I think it is this, you know, using, uh, setting the example so people can see that it's possible. I mean, with lawns, I mean, I had this battle with my own husband, you know, he does like this tidy lawn um, and rather than sort of take the key element out of the lawnmower so he can't actually use it, which worked well last year because it last week because it fell to pieces. Um, you know, you just have to say, well, actually, why don't you do a higher cut for a couple of weeks so something can grow? Can you just leave me the bit at the back and you can just mow the bit in the front? So I think it's um, a sort of... Uh, coming to some sort of middle ground and arrangement between us so that he gets a neat bit but I get my rough edges uh, and I think this is the same with a lot of um, talking to people just pointing out or maybe just saying like Pete you know think about peatlands rather than putting peat in a pot so it's, it's that little sort of little nudges I think that work best. Yeah I mean I have thought about this it's, it's like I think it's really important you know I wouldn't want to sort of um you know, I either turn this into a closed world in which it's an echo chamber of everyone who's sort of saying the same thing and then you're all shut off and it's a cliquey little group, you know. Gardening is for everyone. It is for everyone. It, it should be for everyone. And if they've had their ways and been doing things for decades, you know, I think there needs to be some respect for that. Um, and, but it's just, yeah, I think kind of like the common ground is that you're all keen gardeners so mm. you can find that common ground and and find a way out and um i think that would be much better than, than creating divisions we've got enough bipartisan yeah, the world is, is, yeah. it was quite interesting how you get small victories i at my all the old boys on my allotment site you, your air would kill them that stuff they throw around on there it really is and that's just the way they've always done it but it was interesting i put a bird few bird feeders up and the one guy i said he was quite puzzled why i'd want to feed the birds he, he maybe interpret them as things that are going to come and eat your cabbages or whatever yeah. and, and i was explaining how blue tits would eat caterpillars and and so you get into a chat and then you're kind of opening that door in his mind you know and that's how we've learned to be gardeners isn't it so mm -hmm. and i did another uh, one of my clients was talking about he wants a garden so you get into this to and fro don't you about what that space is going to mean and then that's when i try to get my little two pence worth in and he was saying how he has a pressured life and you know he's quite a wealthy guy and he and he wants to come home and cut off from that and i that's when you sort of get your little bit of little yeah. of entrance. i go well how do you want birds in your garden you can do this do you want this in your garden do you want so you're kind of introducing our our philosophy into the to the to the initial situation i think there's lots of victories to be had that way would you agree yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. I like that. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, the next question is definitely for you, Matt. Um, I'm unlikely to get to a bookshop. It needs to get online, maybe. <laughs> <to get laughs> a new book. What yeah. will this book teach us that we haven't heard from other books on the subject, thinking of Dave Goulson's books, etc.? And it's a good point because there are lots of these books out in the ether at the moment. Yeah, there are um, a lot of gardening books, and I really respect Dave Goulson. You know, his books are brilliant. Garden Jungle, especially, I really love. Um, but, you know, everyone's got their own experience. I'm an individual. So my, um, you know, uh, journey that has taken me to this point is different than someone else's. It's, uh, it's different to yours, it's different to Sally's, it's different to uh, Dave Goulson's. So you'll always get that if the book is written from the heart and from the soul, you know. Um, and I do think that most of the best books come out that way. They're not just imparting practical knowledge or, you know, it's not just how to, I would hope, like it, it does have narrative that is, is me giving my emotion and giving my um, experience onto the page. So that's going to be the core difference. I mean, if, if it is that it's uh, you're looking for a practical difference between one from another, it would be that it um, looks to really take the principles of things like no dig, permaculture, wildlife gardening, make it within only the, the ornamental realm. Um, you know, much of it is, is usually to do with growing vegetables, permaculture especially, and things like that. Whereas I've tried to make it set within that um, that world. I mean, the, the two of them will always come together, but they're also so vast and so big that sometimes you do need to split them apart and look at them differently. Growing, growing veg and that also, you know, runs towards agriculture and out, you know, the infield, the outfield, as the Romans used to call it. But you know, in the just, some people might just want their garden to just be ornamental and for wildlife. And, and so the book would just be more for people along that line, 100%. I, I agree, definitely. I really, I felt your personality came over in it quite well. I felt, you know, as a gardener to gardener, that came over nicely, obviously with all the 
the fact the directions and the practicalities that certainly weren't that was a question by the way um i'll just mention it because it's a bit rude otherwise for bridget carpenter what do you think sally you're um you're well you're published and you you're well familiar with this area um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's important that um, we show people how to do things. And I think it works well in a book when you, it's, it's from the heart and it's from your own personal experiences. And I think from a writing point of view, um, I think the, the, the text, the words flow if you've actually experienced it for yourself. Um, and I've had the ups and downs of gardening um, rather than just sort of repeating things that other people have written before you. So, um, yeah, it's very much um, your personal story uh, and what things have worked for you um, with a few pointers along the way. Yeah, perfect. Um, I've got a, a message from Caroline here who says, who's celebrating rough edges, exclamation mark, exclamation, exclamation mark. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Like that. Yeah, but, yeah, I think this is from the same lady, uh, a question as well as, uh, she's asking about healthy soil and she wants to comment, comments about annuals and perennials and they're mm. organic growers in Madrid in Spain and they, were, they focus more on perennials. Is, uh, is there some, what, what were the differences, I think she's asking, between how it affects the soil if you have a perennial or you have an annual? I would say maybe annuals are more, uh, greedy to the soil and perennials would that be a fair way to look at it yeah i mean well if you're growing uh, in you know the sense of vegetables obviously sort of um yeah annuals are going to be looking to grow extremely fast um they're going to put on rapid growth usually extremely hungry plants and um and it's going to be more um interaction let's say with the soil so um, even if you're doing a no dig, um, it's going to be still sort of interaction with that soil and composting and layering and much more. Whereas perennials can be left alone, you know, for a um, greater or lesser extent uh, after a few years. You know, you can start to feed um, at the beginning of the planting, but, you know, that's the, the whole ethos of a perennial system, going out to food forests and stuff like that. It's the idea that the, the interaction becomes less so the, the soil is allowed to begin to make it sort of um, you know dynamic microorganism sort of bio life isn't it the fungi and the bacteria are given more chance so I think on that sense yeah the soil is probably better on a perennial basis than an annual. Sally? Yeah, I mean, I think with perennials, um, the fact that you're not disturbing the soil, um, particularly for those of you in Madrid, um, you want to keep the water, the moisture in the soil. So your perennials are going to um, lead to less soil disturbance. You've probably got a nice, healthy leaf litter layer over the soil to protect it. Those roots will go down much further than the roots of an annual. Um, they're going to have more mycorrhizal um, relationships so I think your soil will have more soil life you probably have more worms and things so I think that that factor of uh, permanent life deeper roots better water um, resilience uh, and less soil disturbance is is definitely the way to go and and I don't know about the others but I'm growing far more perennial vegetables here and my perennial kale um, in my skirt and stuff um, on my artichokes they're all perennial um, and it's lovely because they save me so much time as yes, well. because the veg growing is very intense isn't it if you're doing it seasonally and you're rotating you're always at it aren't you it's not not me maybe it doesn't match in with we have very busy lifestyles I'll say a little bit about annuals I'm, I'm a balcony very big balcony gardener so that's where I grow my annuals I'm a lover I'm on the shade mid lover as I love color summer color I love my garden looking out my office window that's full of organic bulbs it looks amazing so i like i think maybe it's a, a, a the right situation isn't it if you've got a plot of land and you're growing food or you're you're busy or you've got a garden then, then go for the more perennial option and that and contain your annual growing to smaller spaces maybe containers that's certainly the way i've gone about it so i've got a question from mary carrying on from the rough edges she says please excuse my amateur ignorance but can you explain the advantage of rough edges <laughs> <laughs> well um <laughs> It's just going back to the, um, you know, leasing control. So if you're, if she's talking about a lawn, um, if you're allowing it to uh, grow a bit longer um, than the sort of millimeter cut or the cricket pitch, then um, you're going to uh, encourage more uh, insect life and you're going to encourage more biodiversity. You're, to you know, let it sort of be what it'll be. You're, you, a lawn is kind of quite a weird 
bit of planting. So when you let it go long, you realize what you've got, which is like rye and fescue and bent and all this. So it's, they're quite sort of just uh, tough, weird little grasses, but you'll always be surprised as well. If you if you just let any lawn, whoever's got it, if you let the edges go, yeah, always, I always think sort of have areas to sit and stuff. I have children, they need to sit somewhere on the lawn. So it's never the whole thing. I don't think anyone would ever advocate that unless you had a lot of space, but it's allowing some areas, you know, so say cutting half your lawn for people to sit and play. And then the other half and all the edges, if you like to say for wild edges, let that go long and you'll be amazed what you might see. Uh, I remember when my, my dad did it actually out the front and he had a um, orchid come up, you know, it's just amazing. It will, it will only be like one or two things. You're never going to have a wildflower meadow, <laughs> no chance. But there might be certain little things that you just go, oh, wow, I didn't know that was in there. It's incredible. So it's just letting go. Yeah. There you go. You, you also in your book go into, you do give some quite good tips on how to get a wildflower area going uh, when it yeah. comes to lawns. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Because I found that quite interesting. Yeah, I mean... The thing you is, plants and stuff, weren't you? And 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 springtime treatments very early spring. Yeah, I mean, if you're taking a lawn, if you're taking over a lawn and trying to turn it into wildflower meadow, like you, it's um, it's a long undertaking. It's the first thing. Secondly, you need to realise that a wildflower meadow, as we all realise it, is a hay meadow. It's an agricultural process. So the the only sort of natural wildflower meadows you find are in quite extreme places. So above tree lines, up in mountains or um, by salt laden coasts because succession isn't allowed to happen. So the shrub layer and the tree forestry cover isn't allowed to happen. So in agriculture, grazing and hay cutting was how it was, it was kept to what it was. But yeah, it is a, so it's a long term investment. And, uh, but um, yeah, the best way to go about it is if you have a lawn like in autumn, hit it hard, like so scarify, harrow it, do what you like, but you are going to have to take what looks like a lawn down to what looks like just a mess, right? just soil and tiny little tuffets of grass. Then you need to overseed with a 100% wildflower seed mix um, in the autumn. And then the magic, which is uh, yellow rattle, needs to go in there, a little parasite on the grass. So I'm trying to give a really quick whiz bang overview because it's quite a few steps. Yeah, quite yeah, yeah. But if you then uh, do that at the right time, um, <clears throat> then hopefully over the years, as you start to, you must be involved, you can't just leave it. And you, you sort of get into a rhythm of a, of, a, of a hay cut, or maybe if you're lucky, leave it uncut all the way until the uh, spring every year, then um, you really will start to see a massive benefit, you know, a huge benefit, a huge amount of um, native, um, you know, species and wildflowers and, you know, um, you know, the biodiversity will increase massively um, just from doing that one thing. But a big undertaking, definitely. Big undertaking. So you need a patience for it. But you mentioned you yeah. do it in autumn. Is that because that's when seed normally drops? Is that the exactly. best time to go about? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it needs to go through stratification or scarification. So that's what it would do in nature. So, you know, if the uh, wildflower comes up, sets its seed, um, then it needs to go through that process of. Um, uh, cold thawing out, cold thawing out, being roughed around. Um, that's sort of a little bit why like wildflower meadows, hay meadows in the old days used to work because they were grazed during the winter and they say that the hoofing of um, a lot of the cattle or the uh, sheep would actually help the breaking of the seeds and stuff like that. So yeah, the autumn is 100% the best time to do it. Yeah. Looking at breaking dormancy then and stuff that might sit yeah. dormant. And yeah. Have you touched on uh, um, your long eye grass area, Sally? Do you want to um, add anything to that? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because um, the lawn that hasn't been looked after, so no chemicals at all. I don't remove any moss. I don't do anything to it other than the husband comes and cuts it twice a week uh, during the summer months and then gives me a gap. Um, I've, back to my quadrats. Um, I've got 13 species of flowering plant in, in one lawn. Um, uh, that doesn't include the grasses. Those are all the low growing creeping uh, perennials like daisies and uh, ground ivy and all sorts of things. So, uh, you know, you can make something look really quite neat for most of the year. It's, it's lowish cut, um, but it, it's full of flowers at the moment or will be in, in full of flowers. So you don't have to go the full um, way to a meadow. Um, and the other thing I like about longer grass is that the longer it is on the top, the deeper it is underneath. So it's going to be more resilient to drought. 
and then going on to permaculture, um, I love transition zones. Uh, for me as an ecologist, you know, uh, uh, if you have a transition between one habitat ecosystem, ecosystem and another, like um, Rocky Foreshore, you have the most diverse um, number of species. So in a lawn, if you go from short lawn to a longer lawn and then maybe to your shrub, Border, you've got a lovely transition zone so you're going to have the greatest biodiversity of um, plants and animals and things in that zone of long grass so it's a it's a win-win really the two sit side by side you're saying and it's a good idea so one transitions into the other mm. you, you mentioned a lot of species in your short grass how do you encourage those in sally is have you got any methods for that no i they just find their own way in they just find their own way just, in. Yeah. A bit like think, study, yeah yeah yeah. I think the badger helps. The badger helps. It comes in big <laughs> holes. The dogs dig holes. Yes. Uh, and I think a bit of grit, I know, <laughs> bare, bare soil um, gets populated by seeds. So, um, no, I don't do anything with the lawn. I did I say, so you're letting nature take to move in on its own. It's funny, when I was at Westminster Abbey, we did our lawns organic, a lot of them organically there, because I was throwing so, so much nitrogen gets thrown on them, and it's just terrible. It gets into the water system. But actually, a longer cut, a 22.5 centimetre cut, made a massive massive difference to Bellis, Taxarum, all these sort of normal mm. plants. And it does happen quite quickly, doesn't it? Um, yeah, very good. So I think I think longer grass areas are here to stay, aren't they, really? I don't think they're going to be going anywhere. Yeah, Ali yeah. Lewis is saying it's got... Sorry, uh, Matt, are you going to say something? Uh, yeah, I hope so. You know, one of the best things about lockdown I will never forget was that all the um, contractors for the council stopped working. So all of the roundabouts and all of the edges around my town looked amazing. They looked absolutely <laughs> fabulous. You had, a rough, you had a rough town then, rather than just a rough edge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, it's amazing how quickly talk listen to Sally say about things coming in naturally how quickly nature sort of adapts to stuff isn't it how it quickly gets settled settles its own feet um, I've got an interesting question here from Ali she says is it possible to grow organically if you buy non-organic seedlings at a garden centre yeah <laughs> uh, a bit of a devil in the blue sea sort of question I suppose in some yeah. ways yeah it's so difficult because um, you know we were talking about this before we came on is wouldn't ever want to put someone off. Um, you do really want to, it's a lot easier actually, I must say, if you do it online and you can put in organic seed and you, you can you know, look on the website and verify it that way. Um, but yeah, a lot of seed is coated, <laughs> coated in pesticide. Um, so it's a little bit like the compost. Once again, they don't put the ingredients on. You've, you've really just got to try and read every little bit of information you can on there. These days, we're all sort of pretty um, phone happy, so you can get on the phone and, and, and look them up and just try and find out. Because if you want to go the whole nine yards, then, yeah, I agree with that. That, that it is going to be coated in, in pesticide if you don't find the organic seed. Sally? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for majority of gardeners, organic means growing whatever you've bought in, be it seed or potted plant, um, without chemicals, without um, pesticides of any matter. So I think from that point on, yeah, you can be organic. Um, just don't look at those shelves in the garden centre full of all those horrible garden um, things that you can use. Um, spray this, add that. Um, key thing is not to put artificial fertiliser on your soil, so if you want some soil lime. Life, um, and go forward from that point but make decisions going forward to maybe next year look for the um, organic gardening catalogue look for um, suppliers who will provide you with organic seedlings which are possible online rather than through your local garden centre yes yeah, so i think that the, the, so the, basically Try to be organic. If you've already bought the seedlings, be as organic as possible, but try and give it a swerve next time, I think is probably the answer. Yeah, OK. Um, I've got a, a question from Naomi. This is quite an in-depth question, a no-dig question. She said, this, this early spring, I moved three foot tall, 15 foot long, 20 year old box hedges. That's quite a mission. To put honeyberry bushes, strawberries, thornless blackberries, plus lupins and sweet pea for nitrogen fixing. I put cardboard, then compost on top and planted through that. Should I have improved the soil beforehand? No, no, it's a quick answer to that, isn't it? Really, no, done very well. Like, yeah, um, sounds good. I think it's, it, a lot of effort's gone in there. Yeah, there's there's just this massive idea that um, you know you need to be like having this extraordinarily you know 
um, rich soils. It's just not true. I, I think people got confused from the, the feed down from agriculture. And, um, you know, when, when, you know, farmers are depleting the soil to such a degree, they, they worked out they need to put it back. But generally, a soil in the garden is not going to be like that. Um, and uh, sounds wonderful what she did, I think, you know, have, you know, five stars. Well done. Sounds good. <laughs> Sarah, you want anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's how exactly how I would have done it as well. Um, cover it up, mulch it. And, and I think the key thing about healthy soils for me is, is, you know, soil organic matter. And it's also the diversity of microbes in your soil. And, and I keep banging on about this. You know, you put artificial fertilizer in your soil, it's going to knock out lots of your microbes that are doing very specialist jobs. And I sort of relate it to fast food and artisan food producers in that you keep fertilizing your soil, even with organic matter, but if you keep fertilizing it and giving the plants ready-made fast food, they're gonna take all those um, nitrates from the soil boost great big lush growth that's going to attract pests um, and all the lovely artisan microbes that are going to be doing some of the more specialist um, nitrogen um, recycling are going to be out of a job and over a number of years you're going to lose that biodiversity in your soils and that's what I think is an unhealthy soil a lack of biodiversity and the soil life leads you to you know, unhealthy plant growth. Um, and so, you know, just keep on feeding the soil, um, get those microbes and just just leave the um, artificial fertilizer at the garden centre. In, in a way, the artificial plant is like it gives them a rush as you get a rush, don't you get this spur of growth? And, uh, and it tends to be very quite fleshy. So it encourages uh, mildews and all the funguses in and then it dies off. So therefore, the plants don't perform after that. I think it's been a big lesson. The no dig thing I found really interesting coming from a man who was a parks man who loved a bit of double digging. I will not lie about that. But the fact <laughs> that is that the soil does it for you. We don't need to get involved in it at all, really, do we? It's got everything you need is in. And so that kind of holding back, not trying, resisting the urge to interfere all the time is, is, uh, is, is the one to do. And obviously it sounds like you're doing a brilliant job, Naomi. <laughs> I have a, a question from Matt here. Do you have any quick wins, starting points for a small city gardens with postage sites and um, stamped lawns? Keen to add ecology into the garden, but young kids like the space. He hates fake grass. They battle over the little lawn not to be tr trampled borders, etc. Any ideas? Because you have a lot of brilliant ideas in that book. How would you translate it to a smaller area? Yeah, well, um, he's a brother in arms because I have a very <laughs> cool garden. Uh, and I have two young children. Um, you know, I'm a professional gardener, so I get to go out in these big gardens and live it every day of my life. But so, um, I, yeah, I feel his pain. I, I understand it. So, yeah, you need areas for them to play. So you can't go around thinking that you're going to be able to just have long grass everywhere. So what I do is a vertical. You know, vertical is a really great way to go. So look at all of the spaces. I even mine's even north facing, but. If he's lucky enough to have a, a south facing wall that goes out into his small postage uh, stamp garden, then get some sort of troughs or little pots and get some trellis going up and, and grow up. And, um, and on that, then also pots. So pots are really just a great way of just creating the soil level um, in a garden for planting that's, you know, just completely raised and, and brand new. So more pots, the better, you know, people are sometimes a bit afraid of pots. They think, oh God, I've got a water, but, um, <clears throat> you know, they are in that situation, just a fabulous way to introduce it, and try new things and sort of take it out if it takes up too much room without, you know, doing any sort of major landscaping. So yeah, vertical and pots would be a great way to go. I think it's um, all my eyes balcony gardener. And I'm always, even all the years I've been a gardener, amazed about the results you can actually achieve on a small space. I always kind of think of the gardeners that the balcony is a cube, never a flat space. So if, yeah. you know, if you've got railings, I hang all my hanging baskets on half hanging bars for that. I have a thing called a salad bar where I have a big trough and I organically grow fast <laughs> crops like rockets, cut and come again. And they really? grape them onto the plate straight off the balcony organically in a peat free soil and it means i'm saving a fortune on you know these vacuum packed bags of salad leaves you get from the supermarket which are a oh, God, yeah. i think it's important to, to say it, it, space is not really a, a concept you say you can it, by, you can just do everything on a smaller scale my my big tips i think is i'm the watering is the big catalyst for everything in a garden i think when i especially a balcony garden when i water it, i'm bonding with my plants i water every plant individually and i'm looking at their progress 
and I'm seeing if anything needs doing. And I then be, I have skin in the game. So basically, you then start to create something quite nice. I am a big believer in containers, not open ground, but I will use seaweed extract as a foliar feed earlier on in the season. And I find that gets me very strong, healthy plants quite early on. And I might throw a few country pellets in yeah. onto the containers uh, in, in the summer as well. What do you think, Sally? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, she says she's never had a small garden. She's got a half acre garden out the back here. Um, <laughs> I think, um, yeah, definitely vertical. And I wouldn't overlook something like an arch that would link two areas together and, and provide you with a brilliant trellis, for your runner beans and your climbing um, beans and things. So um, that will give you your edible, edible arch uh, and maybe run a few um, sweet peas amongst them as well to give you a few flowers. So that's, that's my input there. <laughs> it's supposed to be in a little way. So you might have a large area, but you obviously compartmentalize things, don't you? So you have certain areas for certain things. Could that be applied, do you think, to other areas, into smaller areas? Would you, could you consult people on that or? Um, I mean, I think for me, um, yeah, I mean, you can easily have your veg, your, your raised veg beds and things as your, your edible area uh, and extend it up the walls and things. Um, and the other thing is if, I think with edible, look at your planting because you may not necessarily want 100% ornamental, but start planting, say, something like a rhubarb chard uh, and some of these more attractive beetroots and things amongst your ornamentals. So you've got your edibles and ornamentals in, in your small space. And, you know, actually, uh, one thing um, I was thinking was that he said he had children. And a lot of times people were sort of going, and a lot of those things sound like they may be poor kids as well but um I've, I've noticed you know they, people try and get in and i've done it try and get a sand pit in or something for them to play with you will never find um something that will keep them more entertained than bringing wildlife in your garden so like some old rotting wood and having some wood lice under there and stuff like that if they find that they're done for hours hours and hours and hours so in a, even in a small space if you can sort of have some, um, even if you wanted to build like a little bug palace or something, you know, some, or somewhere for, uh, you know, bees and, and, and some rotten wood, then you, you'd do fantastically well for your kids in a small area, yeah. Yeah, I think the important thing is to give them a stake, isn't it? Give them a, 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 a part of it and then they kind of protect it then, don't they, in a way oh, yeah. you sort of give them some ownership, I suppose, that's the way, <laughs> the way about it. They, they go absolutely mad for the wild wildlife, you know, I've gotten yeah. a lot with kids, so. And if you know they dig up a worm, they can't believe it. It's they got that genuine excitement about it all, which is always really refreshing. Um, I have another question from Naomi, and she says, if you have spring flowering plants like snowdrops, that wild daffs, celadine, bluebells, is it expected too much to have summer autumn flowers? So, i.e., i.e. Uh, wild carrot, yarrow, etc. Can you continue that on if you were operating in the same area? I assume. Um, it's certainly not. No, but I guess what she's saying is that the conditions to grow bluebells might be a certain way, but her plants are pretty resilient. A lot of those that she's saying are um, native uh, flowers, they all were, I think. So they're pretty tough, uh, pretty resilient. And they don't require hugely sort of um, different um, situations, soil situations, aspects is what I'm talking about, sunlight. Um, so I uh, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, that it's likely that Celandine especially, when bluebells are going to start to uh, colonise the area. So it could be that, uh, especially wild carrot, it does actually quite like a really well-drained soil, um, almost maybe even like a chalky situation. But so it might get it might get a little bit pushed out. But I, I wouldn't from the beginning. I you know love the idea. Yeah, I mean plant out that way from the beginning, and and maybe if certain things, I was thinking you know, something starts to take over a bit, just take a little bit out, you know, you're interacting, aren't you? You're just working with it. So it sounds lovely to me. Yeah, nice planting plan. I suppose in a way you're talking about um, succession gardening, aren't you? What, letting one thing mm. follow another. That is that is that the kind of um, mind's eye you'd have when you look at an area? Can you get it so it flows through the seasons, I suppose, in a way? Yeah, I think that's what she's looking to do, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, 100%, you know, it's seen as, as quite... Um, a big thing in planting plans in in sort of uh, you know high high end design let's say is, is this succession and i do think it, you know you do need to consider it it's a lot of fun i, I only ever 
try and keep it quite simple kind of think but if you get three sort of um movements throughout the the year of, of a sort of collection of different plants then you're doing pretty good but um it depends completely on your space so like if uh, if you have a lot of space then you can allow just bluebells to sort of take over and then you, these the, these might be under a beech tree and um and then the beech tree comes out and there's not a lot there for a while so um, yeah, succession works in, in, in very high impact areas and it's sort of quite a common thing for very, um, you know, ornamental borders, but it doesn't always have to be like that. But yeah, you, if you can take and bring about biodiversity you know, within one area, um, that means lots of flowering throughout the season, then that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think, Sally? Do you have, do you, uh, have such, you, sounds like you've got a bit of space. Can you get things flowing through the season? Yeah, we've got um, a bank, sort of the remnant of a wall that's fallen down many years ago, and it's just sort of very rough soil, very gritty. Um, we had snowdrops, we've had daffodils. These are all naturalised. I've not done anything with this. Um, we've had celadine on it. The cow's parsley is coming up. Uh, it's under a willow tree, so the, the dapple shade will allow quite a lot to come through. Um, it gets a bit weedy over summer months, um, and then we've actually got a couple of cyclamen appearing in autumn. So it's, it's a really nice succession, and I don't do anything to it, which is even nicer. Um, and they all cope, and, and when they get a bit overcrowded, then one or other of them will survive. I noticed the ground ivy is coming up at the moment and some bugles. So that's looking really nice. The purples against the end of the daffodils. Um, we've got some great parsons out there. They're popping up. They've all sown themselves. It's all down the edge of our um, garden where it meets the field. And I just don't do anything other than admire it, which is really nice. It sounds <laughs> idyllic. It really does. Yeah, it sounds amazing. <laughs> You've taken me there, Sally. You've taken me there. <laughs> <laughs> well, going on a long distance haunt off the back of that, Mary's uh, living in Southern California, USA, has got a question. I think she asked this one earlier as well. I love the internationalness of it. Um, yeah. Can the principles of your book be applied to gardens over there, she's asking? Yeah, well, I mean, my um, publisher, Chelsea Green, uh, um, have offices and based um, in the UK, but began and, and their main sort of um, thrust of their business is in the United States. And so they've done lots of books that traverse both across the Atlantic. So, yeah, absolutely. It is adaptable. The, I, I read lots of books that are written by American horticulturalists and authors. Um, and what, what you find is there will be moments where uh, species that are only kind of, um, you know, uh, adaptable or endemic to uh, the UK, um, you may sort of you know find that interesting like I sometimes do actually when I'm you know reading about different types of trees and perennials and stuff in America but it may not be able to be adaptable to you in that sense um, maybe creating a wildflower meadow with the species that I mentioned you, you'd have to adapt it to the um, American or even America's so big the actual climate zone of uh, Southern California but Everything else is more of a yeah overview of a practical gardening, ecological gardening that is adaptable throughout throughout the world. You know, it's issues about how you use water, how you are going to look after and and your stewardship of the soil, and how uh, you can reuse and, and reclaim materials, and how you can sort of use your mindset and your methodology to adapt and change and bring about more biodiversity of wildlife. It might not be the same species in every different place of the world but you're if you're changing your philosophy and your view then it's it's universal sure so i mean actually the first chapter would be quite applicable the fact that you're asking the reader to, to take a look at the site to take in what the topography the market all those sort of elements you're asking the water to consider all those before setting out so you, if you apply that rule then then where you're located maybe isn't so important it's just yeah the content might be different is that a fair way to describe it yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, um, you know, go and do, I do quite a lot of consultations for clients, you know, is first thing I say is if they've moved into this new property, right, and they want to do something straight away, a big flashy design, I say, you know, the best thing that you could do is to wait one year and just sort of watch. See what's happening, see what's there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see the look on their face. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'll come back in a year. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely the best thing you could possibly do because all of the answers to your problems will be right there and nature will show you um, before you go and make the mistakes and then try and go and put back what you took away. So, yeah, observation is always a massive thing for gardens. Yeah, exactly. So having a look, taking your time over it and seeing what's there is so important. It really is. If you take over an allotment, you don't know what's, if you take it over in February, you don't know what's going to be there in June. It always kind of unfolds, <laughs> isn't it, in a yeah. way. Yeah, so have you got have you done anything uh, internationally with the climate change uh, book at Sally? Um, not so much, but I have visited quite a lot of the states. Um, and I'd say for somebody in you know Southern California, you know, look to your native species, the ones which are adapted to that very extreme seasons that you get with the dry periods, and that your growing season is probably going to be quite different to ours, and that your summer is going to be quite a dormant period, um, and you'll be looking for different types of bulbs and things which can cope at different times of year, spring and autumn. So yeah, always look to the native species, look to what, um, the native habitats and uh, see what's going on there and try and use those types of plants um, in your garden spaces and um, and try it out and definitely wait I'd, I'd hate people to move into new gardens and start digging beds <laughs> it drives me nutty so yeah I think watch, watch and learn <laughs> have a look what's going on take your time no rush uh, good gardeners practice patience don't they I think we're kind of um, come towards the end now I think well, I've got one last question to be nice to finish on um, and that is what are your favourite indigenous native plants? I think that's quite a nice place to sort of uh, finish. I know that this is something you touch on in your book, Matt. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I do feel like, you know, because um, you know, within horticulture, long enough to, you know, have known that you know, it is a real big debate, <laughs> the native um, debate. But I think it's more to me about, like, you know, coming back and and sort of um having great passion for our natives again you know like we do in the sense of trees and and um shrubs you know so i think there's more, more quite folkloric towards that but less so in sort of some of our more perennials and stuff so i love the stuff like ragged robin i really love ragged robin you know and if you can go out it's quite difficult to go out and find it in the wild but um i know of a meadow near me um that, that has it growing in there and if you can go and see ragged robin uh, or grow in your garden which is what, you're, what i'm mainly advocating it's wonderful wonderful um you know flower that lives up to its name it's all ragged pink flowers you know like just falling all over the place generally in a sort of damper condition um what else i mean i love the sort of cow party that's going to come out pretty soon you know seeing that just frothing along the the you know the roadsides is, is fantastic and um i do love the, the hazel for its adaptability it's just such a wonderful plant everyone should plant the hazel um and um and then like the, like i say the real ones that are being pushed to the margin is it's like something like Medicare. So there's salvias that you can buy in um, garden centers, uh, you know, legion. <laughs> it's just, but you won't find the Medicare. You won't find our own salvia. You'll find every other salvia under the sun, but you won't find our own. So I love, I love those sort of uh, native and indigenous species and that we are losing them. Medicare is actually threatened. So, yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think some of those are some of my favourites. So plant them is a good one then. You want to get, get people to plant them, eh? That's the, the big yeah. thing. What about you, Sam? You got any favourites? Um, well, at the moment, my favourite is just finishing, which is Snake's Head Fritillary, um, oh, I love, which I, love I, I adore. Yeah. Um, we've got a really wet area that floods a lot, which is perfect. Heavy clay soil, wet, wet weather in winter. Uh, and it's gone bonkers. It's naturalised um, here and uh, gets me very excited. And then the other one I think is blackthorn because I like seeing it this time of year. Yeah. It's great for nesting. It's really impenetrable, so it keeps animals out and um, does the job well around my boundaries of my garden. It's good because it's, it's been very beautiful this year. It seems to be very full in flower this year. I yeah. think I'll finish. Yeah, it has. It's been a very beautiful year for for blackthorn. I, I, I'll finish. I think with. Um, with the birch tree with betula and i'll finish with that because i've traveled extensively I li i've lived abroad for a while as well and i always just kind of reminds me of home and it and it and it just has that incredibly relaxed look about it you know the way it weeps and it just if i look at a birch i instantly feel and maybe this is the part of the, the beauty of being a gardener 
is any stress that I have is automatically rubbed out when I look at a bird. <laughs> it has this fascinating mycorrhizal association with Amanita muscari as well. So there's ecosystems going on with it as well. If I, it's a hard, if you go into schools or not, they always ask you what your favorite plant is, and it's never an easy question because it changes all the time. <laughs> And, uh, but for me, the native, the bachelor pendula, and it, it is, is a beautiful plant. Well, I think that's I've really enjoyed that. I hope you have too. I want to say that absolutely. thank you for yeah. good. And you enjoyed that, Sally? Yeah, absolutely. Good fun. Um, yeah, loved it. Thank, thanks to all our uh, our listeners. Um, and, and thanks for all the questions. I really appreciate that. I'm going to hand back to Rosie. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris and Sally and Matt. Um, that was great. It almost makes me think we should do this monthly. Just have a uh, one of our one of our panelists is saying this is great. We can just it's like we're chatting in the allotment about all our progress. Yeah, nice comment. I saw that. Yeah, nice <laughs> you know you've got the right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've learned a lot for sure. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. We'll we'll end it there. You can you can you can find both Matt and Sally's book. Um, Sally books um, wherever books are sold so support your independent booksellers or you can go to Chelsea Green for Matt's book as well um, and thank you for joining us and I hope everyone has a lovely evening so thank you bye-bye